Okay. Thank you all for coming here on this summer, beautiful summer day uh, to listen to me, but you will also not just be listening to me, but you will be seeing many, many images um, about my work and the work I'm continuing to do. Um, I think you can turn these lights down so we can um, see it a little, little better. Um, I have many thanks to give um, to the Haran Dink Foundation and to Nayat for uh, inviting me to, to speak here. And I have many friends in Istanbul and actually around Turkey who've helped me with my work. Um, uh, there's some of them here in the audience, uh, Asana, Gunal, and uh, Kirkor, Saraklu. Um, uh, there are many others who helped me, including uh, Ishinono, who's helped me with the, uh, with the exhibitions. Um, I'm going to, I don't have a written speech, I'm going to tell you about my work and how my work has developed and evolved over the last 10 years. Um, much of it has taken place here, but also around the world. I just returned from a trip to Cambodia and Vietnam. Uh, I presented some of my work there, a little more philosophical, but still on the theme of genocide and reparations. Um, let me say, a few words about the title. I use this word, presencing. It's not a very uh, common word in English, but it means an action or process of summoning up the presence of something, the action of making something present. And my work has been dedicated to making present the absence of the Armenians, not just here in Turkey, but for people around the world uh, to, to experience what, it, what had disappeared to a certain extent, not fully, uh, but in a sense what was lost as a result of 1915. And um, this is connected with, I, I chose this, this quote, uh, which r really captures my motivation for the work I'm doing. This is by uh, Robert Bevan. He's a British writer on architecture. He's written that if the touchstones of identity are no longer there to be touched, memories fragment and dislocate. And when he's talking about touch, he's, he's a, a scholar of architecture, so he's talking about the dest destruction of the physical presence, the buildings, the architecture, the homes uh, in a community, in a country. Uh, his book, The Destruction of Memory, Architecture at War, has different chapters has chapters on World War II, has a chapter on the Armenians, which was uh, uh, beautifully written. Um, also chapters on other destructions of, of architecture. But let me read on. It says, if these touchstones of identity, meaning what it means to be who you are, are no longer there to be touched, memories fragment and dislocate. Their hostile destruction is an amnesia forced upon the group as a group and on its individual constituent memory members. Out of sight can become literally out of mind for those whose patrimony has been destroyed and for the destroyers. So it, it's both 
those who perpetrated the destruction and those who were the victims of the destruction are at a loss. They lost something. And in a sense, the work I've done here involves not just what was lost for Armenians here and Armenians around the world, but it's for what was lost for Turks here in, in the Republic of Turkey, what, what the citizens of Turkey have lost. Um, the other important thing about this quote is the idea of the group as a group. And uh, this is important in my work on genocide studies because genocide is not just the destruction of human beings, of individuals. It's not physical extermination. It's the destruction of a culture. It's a destruction of a group. It's a collective crime. It's a crime against a group. You can actually destroy the group and the individuals could still be living by taking away their identity as members of that group. So it's, it's important to understand for individual identity or what I like to call the social self, it's important to understand that the social self is more than the physical self. Uh, and that social self is created by one's culture. And this is something that Raphael Lemkin, the individual legal scholar who coined the word uh, genocide, fully realized as early as the 1930s. And he began to write about the this idea of, of a group destruction in response to what had happened to the Armenians, not what had happened to the Jews. It hadn't happened yet to the Jews of Europe. So in 1933, he wrote um, a paper to d be delivered at a conference in Madrid, the League of Nations, and he wanted a new international law. And in that article, he wrote these words, an attack targeting a collectivity can also take the form of systematic and organized destruction of the art and cultural heritage in which the unique genius and achievement of a collectivity are revealed in the fields of science, art, and literature. So it's again attacking the collectivity. And Lemkin, who developed the concept of genocide, he didn't have the word yet. He, he came up with the word in 1942-43. Um, at that time, he labels such crimes acts of vandalism. Such destruction has come to be known as cultural genocide. So what my focus has been is to look at how this collective, um, how the collective has been destroyed and how that is done by attacking one's heritage, one's language, one's literature, one's architecture. And my, my, then my memory work, of which I began in 2009, um, falls into four categories, though they are over, overlapping, they're not separate. The first that some of you might be familiar with are the exhibitions. And uh, I'm just curious, have any, did any of you here go to the, the exhibition in Depot in uh, 2013? Uh, just a, a, f a few. I know the the creator of it is right there, the designer, <laughs> Kierkegaard. Um, but we have four exhibitions, and I, I will just quickly go through them. I'm, I, we don't have time. Um, I promise to try to keep this short, but I, I, I'm not very good at that. Uh, what I call my micro-histories, uh, telling particular stories within the broad 
macro story, the macro history of what happened to the Armenians. Um, various publications, talks, my books, the film documentaries, and last but not least, most important, the sites of memory. Uh, I, I was at the, uh, the site of memory for Haran Tink this afternoon. Um, it's, it's, a, a, it's an amazing uh, site, uh, well worth one's attention. So, uh, for those who are not familiar with my resources, what am I using to tell these stories, to have these exhibitions? The photography, which is so central to the family. Um, my grandfather, Sorab Dildilian, began taking photographs in 1888. And uh, two generations of photographers, Solag, then his brother joined him, his cousin joined him, then his sons joined him, and the family continued photography for almost 100 years, 1888 to the 1980s in Connecticut, where my uncle Hamayag gave me these thousands of photographs from Turkey, but there are also thousands of photographs taken in Greece and in the United States, and I will show you a few of those. Written in oral memoirs of two generations of the family, many letters and documents. Many of these I'm discovering as we go. Members of the family give me material. I found just a year ago, the deed to the vineyards that our family owned outside of Marzavan, uh, and then my travels and conversation. So this is the, this is the beginning of, of the story with my grandfather, Solag, who I never met, who was born in Yozgat, but the family was from Sebastia, from Sibas, and he died in Greece. This is one of the studios that they had in, in Samsung. And this is just some examples. Um, these are all in, in a book that uh, was, was published uh, two years ago. It's my grandfather as a young man with no beard and his partner in the Torian. This is typical of this period of Ottoman photography uh, in the three languages, in Ottoman, Turkish, in Armenian, and in French, the commerce language. And these are this is the first photograph my grandfather took of his brother, who would go on to join him uh, in the photography business. And these are two examples of photographs that he took of his grandfather, my great-grandfather, um, uh, Krikor. Um, I love this one. Krikor loved this one. Uh, he, uh, he was a businessman. He thought this was uh, not a good sign of a businessman too expressive. Um, this is uh, his younger brother, Aram, um, who uh, unfortunately, because of an injury, lost his leg, but he came to the United States after the turn of the century, studied photography at the first college of photography in the United States, in Illinois, went back and joined his brother in the photography business. This is Aram typical photographer on a horse with his cameras and equipment. Uh, they had studios, but they would travel from village to village to village to take photographs. And this is where the family settled after Sivas. They moved to uh, Merzifon. And this was the city where my mother was born and my uncles were born and where my grandfather uh, built his house. The, the Dildillians were noted for these panoramic photographs. This is an example of one of them of Marzavan. It also has some of the, this is the Armenian community here, quarter. And uh, this is my uh, great aunt's house. And then um, this is Anatolia College with my grandfather's house and studio. There's glass here uh, on the roof. And these are the buildings of Anatolia College. Um, this is uh, taken from a panorama. You can see the glass roof uh, where the studio was, and you can see my grandmother's laundry drying in the window. Um, so the exhibitions. Well, the first one was in 2013. 
this uh, Kierkegaard designed this exhibition and all the ones that followed. Um, we can't spend much time on it, but this was, I at the time, I very well attended, wouldn't you say, Senna? Yeah, yeah. And uh, these are just examples of the great work that Kierkegaard had done with, with the images and the text, you know, telling the story of the family. And you can see the large uh, um, reproductions because of the high quality of the resolution of the photographs. This was a section on orphans. Um, we have some examples of the original photographs with postcards that were built, made on our Dildillian photographs. Glass negatives that I brought very carefully from the United States for the exhibition. Um, and this was a special room we set up for the members of the family who didn't survive 1915. All these pictures of people who had been killed in 1915. Um, and um, through the assistance of, uh, of uh, a number of very talented people, we, we were able to... Uh, my name is Carl uh, Dillian. I live in Fonda Old Trail, uh, New York. I was born in Marshavon, and Marshavon is located probably about 50 miles south from Samsun on the Black Sea. It was a college town, and Anatolia College was very close to our house. In fact, our house was a part of the campus. Marshavon was a, a, was a very old city, and uh, with a very large Armenian colony, not a colony, but settlement. Okay, um, we don't have time. Uh, you can actually view these videos on YouTube if you're interested. They're about 10 minutes long. Um, that one is my, my uncle telling what he remembers as a child in Marzvan, and in particular what happened in the summer of 1915. And, um, and then we, we created another short interview, uh, 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 short video uh, of my mother giving an interview about her childhood memories. She was only four years old in 1915. Yeah, because it was the only photographer that section. That's why the Turks didn't kill him. They just uh, be took him as a soldier, and they used to, that's why our family didn't go to uh, Axel. Mm. They were deported. They no. And whoever uh, was there, all my relatives, some of my uh, aunts and so on, uncles, he kept them. He could keep all the relatives they did in Marzvan, whoever was. But the others that were in Samson or uh, Sepatia or Harper, they all uh, were deported and were killed. Okay. Uh, and again, that's also available. That's a section taken out of two and a half hours of, of uh, interview my mother did um, for the Zorian Institute. Uh, then we, uh, we took the exhibition to Marzalon, which was quite a, a moving experience taking the photographs back to where many of them were, were taken, back to the place, in a sense, coming home again to, um, and we, we used this Tashan, uh, again, that we had to redesign the exhibition um, in panels because of, uh, uh, because of the historic building. We had school groups come, um, and then we took it to Diabakur in 2014, which is the Serb Kirogos Church. And uh, here we used, uh, again, text in Turkish, but we also used some text in Kurdish um, and in Armenian. Unfortunately, this is what the church looks like in recent days because of the conflict there. And the last exhibition was in, uh, in Ankara uh, at this uh, uh, space, municipal art space. Um, and here we use the Armenian again. Um, as you can see, it was a large 
uh, and uh, controversial uh, exhibition uh, because of uh, the fact that uh, the municipality had allowed this to take place in a public, public venue. Uh, but there were some very positive things written. Of course, some things written in uh, publications that no longer exist. Um, and, uh, but uh, I've had exhibitions in London, in Yerevan, in Boston, New Haven, Hartford, New York, Chicago. And last year, we had the biggest exhibition in, uh, in LA, Greater LA, in Glendale, two exhibitions, one at an art center and the other one at the main library. And this is the work that uh, Ishan Onol had, uh, she's a, a very experienced and talented curator, and uh, she did the work on this. <laughs> Those are my fingers going through documents. And for the first time, we incorporated a trove of actual documents in the exhibition, including original documents that we put under, under uh, glass. There's a familiar face in the front row. Um, under plexiglass. And we also incorporated artifacts. So you can see here some items from the Dildillian copperware that uh, were donated to a museum in, in Boston, and they lent these items to us uh, for the exhibition. Some of these we have still in the family, but my grandfather's, great-grandfather's uh, tableware. Um, and then we, we created a whole series of new uh, videos in which uh, I talk about the collection, I talk about individual photographs, the... Uh, amazing story of the survival of the family um, through, as, as uh, I noted, through world wars and the Armenian genocide. But what's also amazing is the photographs that survived, and in particular, the glass negatives. I have hundreds of them. These are uh, some examples in their original uh, boxes. And uh, for these to be transported, now, of course, some of them were taken in, in Greece, but clearly some of the negatives here are from Samsung and, and, and Marzalon. Uh, if we uh, take one out, this is one of the I larger ones. This, this is actually I, taken. I this, this image is obviously taken in Greece, but there's some taken uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Samsung. Well, this is... Uh, this is Tzolag uh, taken. This is actually, looks like it's an earlier photograph. So this, this is probably, uh, probably around 1900. So we have hundreds of these um, that uh, made it first across the Black Sea. Little, uh, little dams there. Across the Black Sea and then uh, during a storm um, and the ship was uh, damaged and was almost sinking at times, and then he made it to Greece, and then, uh, then in, in about 1950, these probably came to the United States with my uncle Hamayag, who opened the studio in Hartford, Connecticut. So, uh, amazing story of survival, but both glass and human beings uh, uh, that are connected with this odyssey of the uh, Dildunian and family. So we have in the family possession uh, four of these large photo albums. Uh, this was obviously put together at some point um, in the 19... 50s and 1940s. The album is a Greek album, so this was put together in, in Athens. Um, and 
you can see that they're, they're trying to uh, tell the family story, beginning with my great-grandfather, Krikor, 1838. So a matter of time, we're going to have to move on. But uh, that video, I, I, I highlight aspects of the albums that, uh, that I inherited. And you can see the work I'm doing actually was started by them in the 1940s, in the 1930s, in terms of telling these stories, writing these stories, putting these albums together. They were the ones doing the memory work way before I even became involved. This is just a, 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 a large uh, panorama of uh, Sivas, of Sebastia that we used in the exhibition on one wall. Can't really get the full flavor of it, but you felt like you were going to walk into the city, given the resolution. Uh, and again, we used uh, the glass negatives. We had a number of um, original photographs. I used more original photographs in this exhibition than I ever did. Um, and um the Dildonian family story goes back many uh, hundreds of years. The story of the photography and the role it played in the family uh, begins in the 1880s. And I have some examples of some of the very early photographs. And I shouldn't be touching my grandfather so loud to Dill Dillion, who is pictured sure. here as the a young beardless decision. man. He had a beard for most of his most of his life. Uh, began uh, photography in 1888. Um, and he tells the story in his own uh, memoir about the fact that he was always fascinated with images and light. And even though his father, Krikor, wanted him to be uh, in the shoe business, because they had a big shoe factory, he was fascinated with photography. And it was being introduced in, in, in Anatolia at the time. This is in Sivas, in Sebastia. And uh, with the help of his uncle, he convinced his uh, father to let him uh, study with uh, our, our Armenian photographer who was passing through Sivas. This is the first photograph he takes, and he mentions that this is his brother, younger brother, Alam, uh, holding the, uh, an umbrella, standing next to a prop of a chair. And uh, the first photograph. OK, so uh, the, the exhibition had, I think, four or five videos of various types. Uh, that sort of concludes my discussion of the presentation of the uh, of the exhibitions, I want to talk about the four micro histories that I'm I'm working on. One of them uh, I, I call uh, the story of a photograph, which actually I presented a version of that at the Haram Dink uh, uh, was involved. The conference was in, in back. I forget now what year it was. The conference on Islamized Armenians. Um, I'm writing this piece about while others perished. And this tells the story of the people that were left behind in Marzavan. We hear a lot in the narratives about people who were deported and how they survived. But I'm writing about how they survived there in, in Marzavan at the time. And uh, some of this is from family resources. But I've also located other memoirs written by people uh, in Marzavan and the American missionary presence in. So we have three different perspectives. Then I also have a piece I'm working on uh, what happens with uh, Topal Osman and the final destruction of the Armenians of Marzavan in July 1921. Again, based on both Armenian and uh, American sources and some other sources that I, I found. And the last piece is on the Armenian orphanage of Samson. Aram, that one-legged photographer, was the one who founded the, uh, the orphanage. Uh, this, this was a, a piece that I written and published, uh, and I believe it it's, it's was published by the Haran Dink Foundation. Um, and this is my, my mother in 1915, <laughs> during the time of this story of, of, of uh, rescue. Um, but this was at the uh, Haram Dink. Uh, this was on the unspoken story of survival of an Israelized Armenian family in Merzifon 
This is the story uh, behind this one photograph. So I use the photograph really as a, a touchstone for telling what happened in those two or three months in the summer of 1915. And this was uh, the publication of that piece. Uh, and it's been translated uh, and published in, in, the, in the Gulf states. Um, so it's gotten a lot of circulation. Um, this is the other piece I'm working on, on this uh, struggle of survivals of the Armenians in Marzvan. I love this image. It's not very clear, uh, but down here in the corner are two children looking at the soldiers arriving in uh, Marzvan in 1915. Uh, and then the f third piece is the final destruction of the Armenians uh, in July 1921 by this individual, Topo Rasman. This is a photograph in the family collection. Um, it's taken earlier, it's not in 1921, it's taken in about 1915. I'm not certain, it could well have been taken by one of the Dilbillians at the time. And the last uh, of the micro histories is the Armenian orphanage in Samsun. This is one of the first photographs of the first uh, the five survivors that are brought into the orphanage. And here I have a huge trove of documents that have been saved. This is a, this is a map of all the buildings that were uh, given to them to set up the orphanage. This is a menu, these are the, the weekly menu of what they were served for breakfast, dinner, and lunch. Exactly how much in terms of proportions and grams they had. Um, it's an amazing trove of documents that I haven't fully been able to go through. This says how much each child gets per week. And this is the totals for 346 children at the time. Um, all of this record keeping had to be done for Near East Relief. The Armenians set up the orphanage, but at a certain point, Near East Relief came uh, and uh, took over the orphanage. Aram continued as its director. This is a list of all the uh, orphans uh, that was prepared for the departure in November 1922, when they were forced to leave all the orphanages within the Republic of Turkey, well, it wasn't a republic then, but within Turkey, were closed. They were given very short notice to leave. Uh, this goes on pages, 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 um, multiple copies of this, uh, recording all the orphans, all the teachers, all the people that were allowed to go on the ship. These are just some examples of the hundreds of uh, documents I have. Many of them uh, need, need translation. Um, my uh, future projects um, and future research will now move to the diaspora. And I'm working on possible exhibitions of the Armenian diaspora, and in particular, the story of the Dildilians and the Armenians who arrived in Greece in, November, in the fall of 1922 after the, uh, the defeat of the Greek army and into 1923 during the population exchange. This is not a very sharp photograph, uh, but you can see the Parthenon up here on top of the Acropolis, and this is the one of the first refugee camps. Uh, the Dildilians took uh, dozens of photographs in the refugee camp. Well, they were in the refugee camp. And in the refugee camp, they began uh, to resume their photography business. This is example of once they started to build buildings. These aren't very clear projections, but they, they look better on the image. And this is, this is Tzolag and his sons, and they're building their first uh, studio. Um, seem very happy about manual labor. Uh, and this is the first studio they build in the refugee camp, uh, and it has uh, in, in Greek and Armenian uh, Dildilian uh, photographers. Um, and you can see they somehow got glass for the studio. Um, and of course that wasn't suitable, so they, they started to build a new home uh, with a studio. And this is a letter in Greek. Uh, an architect has been hired to build, and this is from the roof 
you can see this is looking down from the roof. This is how it looks from the side. Their new home and studio in Nikia. It's Nikia now, but it was Kokinia at that time. And this is the house they build in Kokinia. In many ways, I think they're trying to replicate their old home in um, Marzavan. Uh, in a sense, they, they are bringing what they left behind to a, a new location. Uh, this is what the house looked like. These are other houses that are being built. Obviously, they, uh, they had more money uh, to build something more imposing. Uh, here is the house in the refugee camp. Uh, this girl, I think, is my mother, but I am not certain. Uh, um, these are, uh, this is in the port of Piraeus. These are uh, all shoemakers. I guess uh, my grandfather decided to take a photograph of what his grandfather used to do, and many of these were Armenians. Um, they reorganized their church. This is the Protestant church in, in uh, Coquina. There's my grandfather, Dr. Martin, one of the American doctor missionaries, uh, started taking photographs of Greece, just like they took all the photographs of the important uh, classical sites, uh, historic sites in, uh, in Anatolia. Uh, and then, unfortunately, in 1928, there was a major earthquake in Corinth. Corinth was where many Armenian families relocated, and one of the major uh, uh, Near East Relief orphanages was set up in 1923. And um, first there was malaria to deal with, and then in 1928 there was an earthquake. Uh, Tzolag and his son obviously went uh, and started photographing the destruction of, the, uh, of Corinth. Um, 3,000 homes were destroyed, many people injured, though the loss of life was only about 20 or 30. But many of these were, were people who went through a lot of hardship just just 10 years earlier, um, and they're here living outdoors because of the fear of more earthquakes. Uh, they also traveled to Santorini uh, to uh, witness and record the eruption of the volcano on Santorini. So you could see they, they sort of expanded and became quite involved in, in doing what they were doing in Greece including the fact that my grandfather had been the official photographer of Anatolia College, the American missionary college founded in Marzavan, and he then became the photographer for uh, Pierce College, which is now uh, the American College of Greece. Uh, and these are some photographs that he took for that college. Uh, they opened a new studio, um, and uh, the studio expanded over the years. This is what the interior of the studio looked like with the camera, uh, with some of their work. Uh, this was an advertisement for the studio, uh, an example of the kind of work he did. This was Miss uh, Kokinia, Kokinia in 1931, an Armenian woman. Uh, and there, he, there she is again. So you, it's sort of looking at the trajectory of the photographs they're taking from the 1880s. This is still my grandfather taking photographs like these. Um, that happens to be my uncle. <laughs> um, I don't know, this person's unidentified. There are photographs I have that are not identified, including this mosque, this jama in, in Greece, and I haven't been able to locate it and I don't know if it exists, anyone, <coughs> any suggestions, I'd, I'd be happy to hear them. Um, and these are the kinds of studio work they did. This is my mother and one of her surviving cousins, uh, only two survived. And again, this is my mother. And my mother, of course, was the favorite subject of the camera of both my grandfather and uh, my, uh, my uncle. In the exhibition in LA, we had a whole section devoted to Alice photographs. It was like Alice from Baby to Alice to Hollywood uh, uh, starlet. And this is a photograph of the family in 1928. 
uh, about the time that one of the brothers uh, departs for the United States. And then by 1950, uh, 1947, my mother departs for the United States with her mother and uh, my uncle in 1951, who is the photographer in the family, and my grandfather passed away in Greece. Um, these, this is just my, my uh, I'll skip through these, these are the books. This is the, the translation of that book that I published in 2015, Fragments of the Lost Homeland, where I use the memoirs to tell the family story and illustrate it with many of the photographs. This book came out here uh, in 2017. It has a lot of the photographs up until they leave the uh, leave Turkey in 1922. I published another version of this in the United States, but it takes those photographs into the 1940s. So there's an English version with a more expanded uh, number, and that's this reimagining an Armenian home, a lost Armenian home. This has a lot of the photographs from the 1920s, 30s, and into 1940. Uh, these are just some of the articles. This was a film that we made for uh, the exhibition in uh, LA, and I showed it here last year in Depo. Um, um, uh, this has to do with the family came in 2013 to visit during the opening of the exhibition at Depo, and then we flew to uh, Marzavan and we traveled to Amasya, and we visited the family home, which still exists, and there are interviews with the current owners of the home. the home. It's, it's been uh, improved a little since then. It's um, divided in two. Um, Bu ay bizim e, diye geldi. E, tabii siz ise biz de buyurun misafiriniz olun. Bakın evinize. Böyle bir şey tahmin edebiliyor musunuz? Yani günün birinde bir adamın çıkıp buraya gelebileceğini ve bu ev bizim evimizin olabilirdi. Mesela ben şimdi e, müsait olursam So that he's, he, he's saying that he was also lost his home in Greece. Only two families have lived in that house, the Dildillians who left in 1922, and his family, his grandfather, who moved in in 1923. Um, and they knew the story of who the prior owners were, and they were very welcoming. Um, the last part of, of my uh, talk is about the sites of memory, including the family home. Um, I was, unfortunately, I was planning to go to Marzafan this week, but I ran into difficulties because uh, the, the people I was, the, the photographer, the filmmaker I was, I'm working with couldn't get permission from her university because of the U.S. State Department restrictions on level three safety. We would have to go through a more extensive review process for it to be an official s state university visit. But we plan to go and I'm still in touch with a number of people in Marzavan um, who still are interested in the Armenian presence there. And we have a number of sites identified. Unfortunately, after uh, the, the coup, a number of people have left or have been forced to leave, um, but there's still people there, including the mayor, uh, who is Jaipe, who's uh, interested in helping in <laughs> identify the Armenian sites, including the remnants of the college, and I'll just skip through all of these. Uh, this is one of the la one of the important sites. It's a, it looks like a barn, but this was the Armenian monastery, and this played an important part in the story of the community, 
the family and in the deportations, because this is where the individuals were taken uh, to separate the men from the women and children uh, as they set off on the deportation. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is this memory project, which I'm working with, uh, with the University of Connecticut. Uh, the filmmaker I'm working with, Catherine Massoud, um, is a very accomplished filmmaker, uh, has made a number of films in uh, Bangladesh. She now teaches at the University of Connecticut. Uh, we've, th these are photos taken of my visiting, not her class, but the class of Ann Linderman, who has a, a course on uh, motion graphics and digitalization. And I came with the albums, with the glass negatives, with the original photographs, spent a day with the students. We gave them scans of about 50, 60 photographs. And we said, go to it. Do what you can to make these photographs alive. Uh, you know some of the story of it. I gave them the, the, the book uh, to read if they wanted to. Um, and uh, it, was, it was quite an interesting uh, experience because many of them hadn't actually seen photographs. <laughs> uh, to, you can imagine that. Uh, and uh, e the glass negatives were even uh, more amazing. And then uh, they were given a, a week to work on the images. They turned them over to Catherine she picked out the best ones, and we made a 10-minute, she made a 10-minute film as a teaser for what we're going to do in the fall. We have a class scheduled which will be totally devoted to the Dedullian collection. We have 12 specially selected students, some with the digital skills, some with writing skills, some with journalism skills, um, and they're going to take these photographs and we're going to create a longer film using footage that we're going to shoot. We were going to shoot in Marzvan. That's unfortunately not going to happen. But I have 20, 30 hours of older footage, new interviews, documents, and we're going to create something uh, then will be used to, to get foundation support to produce a more uh, finished film product. Um, so this is what they did in, in, in less than two weeks, the sample I'm going to show you. They know the people in the photographs who did not survive 1915. So as you'll see, what they did with these individuals.
Um, they did, an, I thought, an amazing job in, in just a week uh, with the information they were given. Um, and we're looking forward to the full project uh, in the fall. And this will be a continuing project for a number of years through the Norian Fund. And, but we'll be looking for outside support. Um, you know, that's uh, a f photo of the family. Um, all, all my uncles and my mother. Uh, and I, 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 I end with this one quote um, uh, that sort of captures my work, can be understood as a form of bearing witness, a bearing witness that symbolically asserts the moral status of the victims and their membership in the moral community by giving them and their suffering a voice. When we heed that voice, we reaffirm that moral status, however belatedly. The victim's voice may have been silenced in the past, but now there are those who speak for them and of all the suffering they uh, endur endured. And I, I always uh, conclude my talks for the last two years dedicating my talks to uh, the work of Osman Cavallo, uh, who was most instrumental in bringing me to Turkey and all that I've done in the years that I've worked here. Thank you very much for your patience, and uh, we can take any questions you Thank you, for, first of all. Uh, actually, I've got two questions. Uh, just one is about uh, what you think about the photography or taking uh, photograph. Uh, do you think um, it's a kind of a tool uh, or it's a necessity uh, if we think about all the history? Um, I hope it is clear, it's a clear question, but uh, you know that um, Today, for example, that we have all uh, form, uh, I mean, just uh, digital, digital di sorry, digitalized culture that we took, uh, we take, I mean, photographs in one second, but this is different. So uh, 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 I guess it is a kind of a tool, but also it's a necessity to take the 
history uh, uh, for, for the future? Uh, do you think that uh, naturally uh, these photographs uh, have this kind of mission? Uh, if I understand uh, the question, I, I think that even though, as we know, the technology then uh, was much more difficult than what we have today, but I, 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 think, I think the purpose is the same, and it's the capturing of memory. Um, of course, there's just back as it was back then as it is today, there's, this is a tool and it could be used for better or worse causes. Uh, we can use photographs for harming people, for inciting violence, and we can use photographs to engender empathy for people, um, for good causes. Um, you know, the technology makes it a lot easier, and maybe the technology makes it a lot more dangerous a tool because uh, you can do so much more with it. Uh, I've never thought, though, when photography was first invented, there was the sort of belief that this, this captures a reality. Uh, no, it just creates a new reality in the image. Um, and that's true today as it was, was, was back then. Um, so I, I think it's, it's as important uh, now as it was then, of course, I think, as I said, because of the nature of the technology, um, we have to be more diligent about what we see um, and what, we, uh, what the purpose of that photography is. In the Delian collection, there are many photographs of the orphans. Many of those photographs were used by Near East Relief. What was the purpose? It was to engender empathy among people around the world to support these, in, you know, these orphans who needed uh, care and sustenance at the time. There are photographs in the Dildillion collection or photographs that were used by, by the Ottoman, uh, the, by the young Turk government to prove that the Armenians were revolutionaries and they were uh, uh, in rebellion. Um, those kinds of propaganda photographs were taken by the Dildillians. Um, um, but as you can see, they're, they're, they're doing more than just studio photography. They were not just commercial photographers coming to the studio, we'll come into your house, we'll take the class photograph. Uh, they, they were trying to document what was going on around them. And the image of my grandmother and her sister-in-law on the boat I mean, they're taking photographs. They're on this boat. They're being expelled from the country. You know, they were given uh, just over a day to organize and to take all those orphans on the boat. And they're taking photographs of their leaving. They're taking photographs of their arrival at the camp. They're taking photographs of being on the island in quarantine. Um, so there was, a, there was this documentary aspect to it, but they weren't documentary photographers. They were you know, they felt the importance of, of keeping, keeping those uh, events for posterity. And by chance and good fortune, th they s those images have survived, and I can share them. You had a second question. Uh, yes, if I have uh, mm -hmm. kind of time. Um, I work uh, um, as a dramaturg and an, uh, in a performing uh, arts, actually, uh, but mainly uh, body, uh, movement, dance, and then uh, also, also as a memory, and then how we use it in dance and theater uh, mm -hmm. uh, works. Um, so um, I would like to ask it how you relate the art uh, story and uh, truth. Uh, I mean, this fo with these photographs and or how we uh, manage uh, the arts. Uh, sorry, manage the um, the things uh, with arts uh, and also the real life. So, because I mean, in in one way that you're an artist. So, about also a kind of a documentary uh, artist or something. Else, I mean. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, um, I, I, I think the, 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 the as I, as I said, I don't think the photographs are, are capturing truth. They're, they're, they're capturing the truth of the photographer. They're capturing what, what they, just as their words in the memoir are capturing what their experience was. Um, so I don't, I don't think you, you see through the image to the reality, to the truth. It's, it's they're, they're, they're creating their own truth and hopefully uh, they believe that others will see that same, same, same truth. Um, I mean, I, I don't make sharp distinctions between um, what, I mean, what, uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing in my own writing, um, and I, I make that clear, is that I'm not strictly coming at it from the perspective of a historian, okay? I've, I've trained in history, I've trained in philosophy. Uh, clearly, I provide the historical context I provide many of the facts as, as has been decided by many historians over the years. But I also wanted in my writing to capture what these people were experiencing at that time and in that place. They all didn't experience the same thing. But I think it's important to see what, what they experienced. Even when there were obvious errors and mistakes in the memoirs, and uh, they will make mistakes. They will mischaracterize something. They'll get the dates wrong, or or whatever. Uh, and and a lot of those things I discover as I'm I'm writing. And when it's important, I let the reader know about the mistakes. But I I think it's important to to see what their their reality was and what it felt like as Armenians in in this period. And and. We were looking really at, the, at, at a lot of this. Some of this was focused on 1915, but that's not that's not the focus of the photographs. There are very few photographs from 1915 or 1916. There's so many more photographs in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, after the turn of the century that capture the life, the places, the activities of the Armenians. That's what I. That's the culture that I, the heritage that I, I feel are important for identity, and the creation of the new identity, um, including the diaspora, you know, the diasporic identity, what, what it meant to be an Armenian now in Greece. Uh, you know, that, that's, that was, that's important. I don't know if that quite answered your question. Um, but when I, when I teach courses on comparative genocide, I, I give the historical background, but I always do it through the arts, including dance. Uh, I've shown and taken students to dance performances um, that relate to these, these events. Um, anything else? Any comments? You're a quiet audience. Oh, there. Yes. Hi, my name is Negin Bavili. I'm Iranian. I wanted to ask uh, whether uh, have there been any studies that compared uh, Iranian uh, Armenian who moved to Iran, Tabriz, or uh, who have been there with uh, Armenian that who have moved to the other parts of the world like Greece? Have there been such studies or anthropological studies? Um, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not familiar with anthropological studies, but the Armenian community in Iran is much older than the genocide in 1915. They were there from the time of Shah Abbas. Uh, they were moved there from Julfa to New Julfa hundreds of years before 1915. And 
and it's, it's one of, th though there are connections to the Armenians who were in the Ottoman Empire, and there are connections to the, to the losses that happened in 1915, but for Iranian Armenians, the experience is not necessarily the same as the most of the diaspora. Um, in my talk I gave in, in Cambodia, I actually showed images of Armenian sites in Iran in comparison to Armenian sites in Anatolia. The two Armenian apostles, Thatios and Bartholomew, they're two important uh, monasteries and uh, holy sites, one on the Turkish side of the border and one on the Iranian side of the border. And if you look at what the difference between the two, that gets to the question of cultural heritage. Because you can look at photographs of the site before 1915 in, in, in Ottoman Turkey and compare it to what it looks like today. You can look at old photographs of the Iranian site and what it looks at today. It actually looks much better today than in the in, in 19th century. And they're still actively part of the Armenian community in, in Iran. So the story in Iran, and, and I don't know the, s the, the scholarship on it, um, I have too, too many projects <laughs> to, okay. to do, but uh, yes. Just uh, a question, um, a more one more question. Just uh, maybe it's irrelevant. Uh, if it's relevant, you can uh, ignore it. But uh, do you think, is there any relationship uh, between populist populism and hatred discourse? There is a, there's a strong connection between the two. Uh, I am giving a workshop at the end of the m end of August for high school teachers in Connecticut, and the workshop is on uh, white genocide and denial, and it connects the ideology of the nationalist, populist right, extreme right in the United States, and its connection to the history of denial of the genocide, or the Holocaust in particular, uh, but it's also connected to the, the, the crimes against African Americans. Um, that those sorts of, of, of hate crimes have been on the rise in the United States, at the same time that there's been uh, an increase in this sort of right-wing ideology. And of course, we have that in Europe too. We have it uh, across uh, the continent and in, in the UK. Um, so yes, there is a strong connection between the two. And uh, what, I'm what myself and the other people in this workshop are looking at these sorts of connections, um, you know, where where that anti-Semitism and also uh, uh, racism connect to this this ideology that that the white race is 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 being attacked and uh, a genocide is being committed against them. Thank you, Paul Rask. Uh, hi, and thank you for the great talk. I'm just curious about uh, reactions in Yerevan uh, after your exhibition or maybe during the exhibition, because I feel like most of the images people know are either taken by the perpetrator or the German uh, soldiers, and uh, usually the stories, the micro stories of the Ottoman Armenians or the images they are not so well known, and how were the reactions in, in Yerevan? Uh, well, they were, uh, they were positive. Actually, two of the photographs from the collection are in, in the Tsitsinagavert, uh, in the, in the uh, Genocide Museum uh, in Yerevan. Unfortunately, um, the images they wanted were the two images, the one that you saw with the German soldiers and the skulls, and the other one was the picture of the person stretched out on the roadside 
uh, that the students in that class may dis disappear. You know, they, they were looking for the evidence, examples of the evidence of, of the crime, mm -hmm. uh, which wasn't necessarily my interest, uh, but, you know, I, I gave them the, the photographs to use. But I've told this, the story of the, the Ottoman uh, Armenians, and it's, in, it's, it's interesting that um, they're, um, there, are, there were many survivors who, who uh, went to what is now the Republic of Armenia. Uh, so the grandparents and great-grandparents uh, were Ottoman Armenians, and there are many towns that are sections of Yerevan that are named after what used to be the Armenian cities in, in Anatolia. Uh, so there, there is, you know, despite all those years of Soviet amnesia, there is still in the background some knowledge and connection to um, Anatolia. Um, um, and I, I thought that uh, you know what I the, the talks I gave were very well received and, and uh, people were quite interested. Um, it's interesting when I travel there, I have difficulty understanding their Armenian because I was born in uh, in a Western Armenian family. But occasionally, among the older people I meet, whose parents were born in Anatolia, so these are great grandparents, they still have the Western dialect, you know, but, um, yeah, and, uh, you know, I've given the talk also in talks and things in, in London I did earlier this summer, um, and, of course, there's, uh, there's always great interest in, in, in these images and the material, so I keep sharing it. Uh, hopefully, the next exhibition will be in Toronto. Okay? I'm curious oh. about, uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> the microphone. As you mentioned that you started to work on the history of your family in Greece, uh, I mean, wh how is the, I mean, work going on Armenians in Greece? Is there any interest from the civil society or academia? Uh, I mean, are there like, I mean, institutions or uh, academicians working on this topic or Armenian community there? How is their interest in the legacy of the Armenians in Greece? The impression I have is that there hasn't been all that much done. Uh, um, I just today was invited to do a talk in uh, an exhibition in in uh, in Athens. I, I was in Thessaloniki because of Anatolia College mov moving there, uh, and they had great interest in in the presentations I've made. Um, but the, the, uh, the I don't know about any actual scholarship going on. Uh, I applied twice to the Onassis Foundation for a grant to spend a few months in the neighborhood of uh, Nikia, which was the former Kokinia, uh, to go to families with uh, photographs, because there are many Dildilian photographs in that whole community. Because I visited the Armenian church there and the uh, the Protestant Armenian church, and he took out of the bottom of a drawer about a dozen Dildilian photographs that he said, you know, the, they're all over the place here. Um, the family had three studios in 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 Kokinia, so I, I, I that's my next project, and uh, hopefully I'm going to apply again. Um, and see if I can get some support to, to, to do it there. Uh, the focus now has shifted, I think, in, in, in Greek scholarship uh, onto the Pontic issue. Uh, and there was a major conference in Thessaloniki on the Pontian, they call it the Pontian Greek genocide. Well, uh, and they included some pa presentations of the Armenians. Um, but there hasn't been much as I, much as I would hope there would be, uh, but maybe things will change with 1921, 22, 23 or so important in Greek history, and it's so much part of their own own s story, um, and it was so much part of my family because my part of my family, my mother grew up in Greece. She 
She spoke some Turkish, she spoke perfect Greek and learned English there. So um, there, there are some, um, I will see. I'm going to Athens on Thursday and uh, you know, prod some people if I can. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your patience.